Well, good morning, and thank you for spending your Saturday with us. We are so delighted to have you here. I'm Dawn Melling. Uh, I think most of us have met, but it is uh, a pleasure to see you. And uh, we're here this morning because our core principles are being challenged every day, and we want to equip you to better communicate the, the threats to our economic prosperity and also the opportunities to increase our prosperity and freedom in our state and in our country. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to go through a few housekeeping items, and I know we'll have a few more trickle in as well. But I'm Dawn Melling. I'm the community liaison for the Commonwealth Foundation, and we're Pennsylvania's free market think tank. And uh, my colleague, Nate Benefield, is here as well. Nate is our director of policy analysis, and you'll be hearing more from him later. And uh, we're so pleased to be partnering with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And we have a couple uh, Mercatus guys here. We've got Mike Leland over here. And we have his brother, Andrew, who is filming. So thank you, Andrew, for joining us as well. And of course, our speakers, will, which we will uh, introduce as we keep going. Um, also, I wanted to uh, especially welcome Representative Topol, who's joining us this morning. And one of her uh, colleagues in the legislature will be, uh, I believe, joining us as well in a little bit, uh, Representative Harper. So we're very honored that you were able to join us. Um, as I know, we're, getting, we're all getting busier and busier as the, the fall is quickly approaching. Um, so just to lay out the uh, landscape of today, we are going to, our morning session is going to be our three uh, distinguished speakers, and they will each present, and we'll have plenty of time for questions with, with each of them, so please be, be thinking of questions as they're speaking. We're going to really, we kept this small on purpose so that we could be very interactive, um, really pick the brains of, of our scholars, and. Um, dig deeper into what this means for you and your community and in our state. Um, so we uh, want to really encourage a lot of participation. Um, you also have no cards in front of you. Uh, we'll be having a panel discussion at lunch after our speakers. So if you think of a question um, during the second speaker that you meant to ask the first or something broader that, that you'd like um, all of them to address, you can just jot that down and we'll collect those at the end. Uh, we'll have our, our first two speakers go, and then we'll break uh, for about 10 minutes to refill our coffee cups or, or hit the restrooms. But of course, at any point you need the restroom, it is back in the lobby. So you'll make a left out the door, and then another left, head down to the lobby, and again, kind of head to the left, and you'll see the restrooms as well. Um, let's see, I'm looking through my list to make sure there isn't any other burning issues. Uh, your folders in front of you have all the slides that will be up here as well, so you'll have a, a closer look and, and a take home. And I'll follow up, I'll send you an email um, after the event with electronic versions of all the, all the things that we talk about so that you can share them uh, within your spheres of influence. Many of you um, are involved in community and activist groups as well, so this is, this is to equip you to communicate with your groups and mobilize them as well. So with that, we will get started with our first speaker, which is Dr. Keith Hall. Dr. Hall is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. From 2005 to 2008, Dr. Hall served as the chief economist for the White House Council of Economic Advisors, where he analyzed a broad range of fiscal, regulatory, and macroeconomic policies and directed the team that monitored the state of the economy and developed economic forecasts. Prior to that, he was chief economist for the U.S. Department of Commerce. Dr. Hall also spent 10 years at the U.S. International Trade Commission, and he has been on full-time faculty in the economic departments at the universities of Arkansas and Missouri, and has published a number of papers on international trade and international trade policy. Most recently, from 2008 until 2012, he served as the 13th commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in this role, he headed the principal fact-finding agency in the federal government in the broad field of labor, econ economics, and statistics. Dr. Hall received his BA degree from the University of Virginia and his MS and PhD in economics from Purdue University. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hall.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, using an old economist trick here. I've got a bunch of complicated graphs, so whatever I say, you think I'm smart, because I, I drew that ahead of time. Uh, let me just start by um, saying the recession was bad. You know, I know this is a great shock, but I want to give you an idea of why it's called the Great Recession. This is job loss by recession in percent. You see the red line there? <laughs> this is where it got the name the Great Recession. It was a very deep recession, obviously. We lost over 6% of our labor, uh, of our employment. And it's long. It's gone on for a long time. I stopped these lines after the uh, job loss was sort of recovered. Let me point something out, uh, else out, too. My, my last job as commissioner of uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, I, I collected this data. I was, I was the head of the agency that collected this data. That red line is my tenure at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So you see, I did a good job. <laughs> Let me start with, with kind of a story here um, about, about the st what I call the stages of the Great Recession, I guess sort of how it got started. Um, you know, when it started in 2007, I was the chief economist of the Council of Economic Advisors. I was following the economy. I was in charge of the economic forecast. And it became obvious in 2007 that the economy was slowing down. And the obvious reason was that the housing market was starting to decline. Housing prices were starting to go down. Uh, and certainly in my view, and I think it was the absolute truth, the effect on the overall economy was starting to be what's called a wealth effect, right? Because you just had several years of where housing prices had gone up by so much in double digits. If you looked at household wealth, people were getting this big boost in wealth, not just from the stock market, but from housing values. And the wealth effect is a tricky thing for economists because the wealth effect, it affects consumers, but consumers don't think about just now. They think about their lifetime in front. So the wealth effect generally isn't a huge impact on the economy. It has an effect because people think, well, I'm, I, I now have a higher level of wealth. I'll increase my spending some. But when things go bad, they don't think things are always going to be bad. They think, well, my, my lifetime income is going to take a hit, so I'll slow down my consumption somewhat. So I think what we started out with is in 2008, we finally got a, a month of, of uh, negative economic growth. And I think we started in for several months of what looked like, I thought so at the time, and I think even looking back it's true, it was borderline. We were having an economic downturn, and it was at worst a mild recession for eight or nine months. And then the credit markets locked up. And now this is sort of the big fear, because usually there's, a, there's an uncomfortable relationship between financial markets and the real side of the economy, the real side of the economy being actually what people buy, buy and sell, and, and it's the GDP and it's employment, et cetera. And the link is primarily through wealth. And so it's not a, it's not a really strong link. But the real um, thing that everybody was worried about, and there's plenty of worry, I can tell you, in 2007, was that if this got really bad, it would be more than a wealth effect. That if credit markets locked up, that would be the really, really bad thing that would happen. It happened. And we had there, as you can see, for a while, we had there unprecedented job loss. 600,000, 700,000, 800,000 jobs a month. We've never had that sort of job loss before. And the recession finally ended officially in June of 2009. And you sort of notice that where we are at the moment, whoa, is we still haven't recovered. But it ended June of 2009. And there's a reason why they call it. We've had economic growth every quarter since June of 2009. That's why they call the recession. The labor market, in typical fashion, continued to lose jobs from June of 2009 to around the beginning of 2010. And since the beginning of 2010, we've actually had consistent job growth. But if you look at that red line, for example, it's not been strong job growth. I can tell you one of the early debates and, and what I thought was going to be the case, in fact, I, when I was at the council, we even wrote a chapter on it after the 2001 recession. 
Deep recessions have fast recoveries. That's the way it's always been in the past. It's the so-called V-shaped uh, recession. And there are reasons to think that, that that could be true. And my expectation was, here's a deep recession, we're going to have a fast recovery. On the, on the flip side, though, is in 1990 and 2001, we had mild recessions and we had slow recoveries, which is consistent with that theory. But the last two recessions had very slow recoveries. So the question was, gee, is the 2007 recession we're going to have a fast recovery because that's what deep recessions have? Or has the labor market changed? And do we always have slow labor market recoveries now? Right. Well, we've had a very slow recovery. Here's the unemployment rate. You'll notice that um, the unemployment rate hit a peak. Actually, it was in the, in the fall of 2009 of about 10%. And we've had this steady fall in the unemployment rate. And it gives the appearance of an improving labor market. However, <laughs> there's a problem with the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate counts people who either have a job, and by having a job, it means just one hour. So it's real easy to be counted as employed. You can be underemployed, you can be mismatched, but hey, if you got, if you got an hour of work, you're employed. The second thing is it only counts people as unemployed if they're currently and actively looking for work. And by actively, it means literally, literally they call you on the phone if you're in the survey and they say, what have you done lately to look for a job? If you talk about, gee, I ch job searched at the internet, I didn't find a good match, I didn't send out any resume, you're not counted as unemployed because you're not counted as actively looking for work. So they cut you out of the labor force if you haven't done something which by itself will get you a job. And why is that a problem now? Here is labor force participation. This is the share of the population that is either in a job or actively looking for work. If you look at that red line, here's the entire history of the data. We've had the biggest disengagement we've ever had from the labor force in, after this recession. We have had a huge number of people who have been unemployed for a long time who have quit looking for work actively, who I'm sure would, look, would immediately look for work or take a job, but they're not counted in the unemployment rate. So that drop in the unemployment rate from 10% down to 8.3%, entirely due to a drop in labor force participation. None of it is due to hiring. So it looks like we've had improvement in the labor, labor market. We haven't. The labor market, in my view, is probably worse now than it was a full three years ago when the recession ended. And there's very little um, rehiring going on. Here's the median duration of unemployment. So for the average person who gets reemployed, they stay out of work. They stay out of work for. 10 months. Actually, this might be weeks. Anyway, but before leaving the labor force, the average person stays out over 20. So my point is this disengagement from the labor force is because people can't find work. They're just not going up. I'm not going to bother to look. They look for a long time. In fact, we've got a huge number of long-term unemployed, by far more than we've ever had in history. That 8.3% unemployment rate, how much of that do you think is long-term unemployed? Not just people who don't have work, but have been, don't have, have work for over six months. Three percentage points of that are long-term unemployed. So those people who are really sticking to it, they can't find work for over six months, over a year, over two years, and they're still trying to find work. That's a huge part of that unemployment rate right now. This is a kind of a depressing presentation. OK, sorry, sorry in advance. <laughs> I want to talk about economic policy a little bit. 
because I think his, in history, when we look back on this, uh, I think the Fed, the Federal Reserve in particular, they need to look at this graph and think about it. The average, the effective federal funds rate is the simplest measure of, of monetary policy. This is the main tool the Federal Reserve has for affecting the economy. When they drop the effective federal funds rate, they're increasing the money supply and they're stimulating the economy. During the average recession, that black line there is about how aggressive they've been. Look at 2001. Starting with 2001, they got really aggressive. In fact, that was unprecedented by far. They got really aggressive. They dropped interest rates very quickly, and they kept them very low. Let's stick with 2001 for a minute. What kind of effect do you think that's going to have on the economy? All right, it's going to stimulate things, but in particular, it's going to affect interest rate sensitive parts of the economy. Right? So, one of the things that happened, the 2001 recession was a first recession, and so far the only recession ever where consumer spending did not go down. Consumers spent right through the recession. They did not even, it never went negative. So it had its desired effect. And I can tell you what the, what the CEA concluded from this. It was before my time, because I absolutely disagreed with this. Their conclusion was, see, monetary policy can make a recession really short and mild. It was a success. My conclusion at the time, and it still is, is see, here's a limitation of economic policy. The Fed did everything they could, and we still had a recession. I think that was a failure. They tried their best, and we still had a recession. Now, here's where I think history may have uh, a harsh judgment on the Fed. 2007 recession. What's really taken a hit now, and what's really been at the root cause of the 2007 recession? Unfinished business from the 2001 recession. Housing, by the way, 2001 recession was the first recession ever that did not go through a housing cycle. Every other recession has had a housing cycle. Housing spending went down. We avoided it. Consumers spent right through it. Housing never went through its cycle. 2007 comes through. Now we get the housing cycle you didn't have in 2001. All right. I'm thinking that the 2001 recession is a continuation it was continued in 2007. And in fact, we're having a worse time of it now because we didn't play through the recession in 2001 because the Fed was so aggressive. So what's the Fed done now? They got even more aggressive. They lowered interest rates very quickly, even further. Interest rates, and by the way, this is nominal. In real terms, we've had a, a negative effective federal funds rate for quite a while. Fed's doing everything it possibly can. It's, just made this, it's not made this a mild, short recession. To me, this is another failure of economic policy. It, it, it's not working. Except this time, it's not stopping consumer spending from going down. It's consumer spending's gone way down. And it didn't stop us from the housing cycle. Now, I'm not saying that the Fed's doing anything wrong. This is what they do. But Economic policy has its limitations. We certainly saw that with stimulus spending. I'm shocked so many people think stimulus spending is a, something that always affects the economy. If you'd done a poll of economists before the 2007 recession, most would have said, well, no. S spending doesn't really stimulate like we thought. And I think we're at a point, yes. Um, yeah, can I maybe hold them to the end. Normally I like having questions, but they're only giving me 20 minutes, so. <laughs> I could go on for hours. Too many people uh, uh, get really depressed, though, after I do that, so they, they've, they, they've held me back. I saw a headline, which I thought was really great. After the, the last economic data was so bad, the headline was speculating on the, on the Fed, what the Fed's going to do next, and the title of the, ad, uh, of the article was, Will the Fed Throw the Gun? What a great title. 
Because what's happened is the Fed shot all their bullets, right? <laughs> As the old cowboy movie. Once you're, once you're done, nothing you can do but throw the gun at them, right? <laughs> Fed's got nothing. Let me talk about states since we're, since we're out. Let me talk about a little bit. This is real GDP by states between 2008 and 2009. So this is the worst part of the recession. A couple of things that is notable about this recession. This recession has been very deep and very broad, and m the vast majority of states all suffered from the recession. There are a few small exceptions, but, but frankly, they're typically small states that aren't very diverse. A big state like Pennsylvania has a very diverse economy. It's going to follow, to a large degree, it's going to follow the national economy. So when the national economy goes in recession, Pennsylvania goes right with it. You notice that Pennsylvania is sort of right in the middle. I just separated into three categories. States that were really hard hit are the, uh, well, middle colored, are the uh, light colored states. The ones that had it easier were the dark colored states. You notice Pennsylvania is sort of right in the middle. And here's the unemployment rate. Um, the black line is the national unemployment rate. The blue leading into red, red is the recession, is the Pennsylvania unemployment rate. And you notice it's a similar sort of pattern. Um, there's been sort of the same sort of pattern, but you notice that Pennsylvania probably wasn't hit quite as hard as the average state. In fact, it probably has had a better, better job of it than others. It, it's a similar pattern, but it didn't peak as high, even though it started at around the same as the, uh, as the national rate. It's had a sort of a similar drop. And you notice with this disengagement from the labor force, the red line again is the labor force participation. Pennsylvania's had a similar pattern. There's been a pretty big disengagement from the labor force, but it probably hasn't been as extreme. You notice it happened a little bit later, and there's been, there's been a little bit of a recovery in the labor force participation in Pennsylvania. And I can tell you, I don't have the graph here. I can tell you, for example, that one of the big issues right now is, is the jobs that are being created. Wage growth is very, very slow. So I think there's an issue of poor job creation. We're getting some jobs being created, but it's poor creation. It's not very high. In fact, the last 12 months, nationally, um, in fact, I may have that graph next. No, not yet. I'll get to it in a minute. I'll talk about uh, wage growth. All right, I want to get back to the national numbers. I want to talk about the, the composition of the, uh, of the downturn. Labor force participation, this is the big disengagement. I've broken it out by age. A couple of things are really notable. Look at 55 plus year olds. They're the only group that did not get a reduction in labor force participation. Look at teenagers. In fact, look at that labor force participation since the since the late 1990s for teenagers. Teenagers don't work anymore. And they've been really hard hit from this recession. And 55 year olds, what's the story there? Well, you've checked your 401k lately. I think there's a story here of, of baby boomers putting off their retirement because they've been hit hard by the recession. And they're gonna wanna try to hang into the labor force longer. And you know, 20 to 24-year-olds have also been pretty hard hit. That's, that's a really a prime age. I mean, the labor force participation by that group is, is, really, is really starting to get up. It should be up there pretty close to 25 to 54-year-olds. They've been particularly hard hit. Now, part of why I think this is interesting is a policy issue. Um, if you look forward over the next 10 years, this is something that people don't understand. Most of the job creation that's going to happen, in fact, two-thirds of it, is going to be replacement hiring. It's people moving into jobs as other people either move up in the ladder or retire. So most, of, most people moving into new jobs is, are replacements. They're not, if you wanted to focus on, on job creation, you probably don't want to focus necessarily on all these growing industries, because those growing industries are great. But there are an awful lot of jobs which are just replacing people as they retire and move on in their career. Two-thirds of jobs are in that category. What happens now to the young 
if the, if the baby boomers slow down their, sh their move into retirement. They get a second hit, don't they? They get hit not only because there's just slower job creation, but there are also fewer people retiring at the other end of the line to retirement. And I think that's going to be a policy issue going forward. Private versus public employment. Obviously, the bulk of the impact of the recession was the, it was the private sector, as you might expect. You see the federal government, you guys see the spike there around right near the beginning of 2010? Census. Census hiring and firing. So they hired them, did the census, let them go. And you notice the pattern in state and local government. That's actually unusual because lots of times state and local government employment doesn't go down, didn't go down the last recession even at all. Right? Because the public sector doesn't have to, they don't have to worry about, they have to worry about budgets from tax, tax dollars. They don't have, they, they're not worried about the economic downturn. Well, now it finally hit, right? After some point, budget started to, to get tight on state and local governments. And they didn't really start losing jobs until after the recession is over. And they've been steadily and they still are losing jobs right now because of, of, I probably don't have to tell you guys, of tight budgets. Now this is, my, this is what kind of job creation are we getting? Average hourly earnings, this is 12 month growth, and this is basically wages, this is the most commonly cited wage series. Look at that red line there. This is before inflation. Wages only grew 1.3%. That's the lowest ever. This hadn't gotten much press, but what job creation we're getting, which is not enough. By the way, why isn't it enough? Well, I can tell you since, since the beginning of 2010, we've averaged about 127,000 jobs a month. That's not enough. Every month, the working age population right now is growing to about 190,000. So we have a growing population that needs to be supported. So if you're getting an extra 190,000 people who are working age, you need 130,000 jobs to support them. That's my estimate. So any job growth below 130,000, you're actually falling back. 130,000, you're holding still. So this is like zero is not zero. 130,000 is zero. So we've basically had zero progress over the last three years in job growth because it's not been greater than 130,000. So how far are we from full recovery? We're now three full years after the end of the recession. Three years, all right? This has been the weakest economic recovery on record, in my opinion. Not only was this the worst recession ever, this is now the weakest recovery ever. This is an estimate of how far are you from economic growth, where you should be in terms of economic growth. One of the things that happens in recessions is economic growth goes down, but after recession's over, typically economic growth is above average and you actually get payback. All right? Here is three years into recovery. Here's economic growth above potential for all the past recessions. We're still five percentage points below where we should be in terms of the economic growth. That's how far behind we are. And maybe this is it. This is my absolute favorite measure of current economic conditions. This is, the, this is something simple. Remember this disengagement from the labor force that makes the unemployment rate unreliable? This is entirely reliable. It's the employment ratio. Look at the population. What share of the population has a job? You don't have to worry about whether or not they're actively looking or not. All right, first of all, you notice that the employment ratio has had an unprecedented drop. <laughs> More importantly, what's happened since it dropped? Nothing. <laughs> this is my point about the job growth has just kept up with population growth. No progress has been made. The employment to population ratio, this employment ratio, 
I think is, is the best indicator, and unless this number goes up, we're not improving. Like I said, I think you could make the argument that we're not making real progress and we're not into a recovery. We're just at, on hold at the moment. Here's another way of looking at it. This is actually maybe my one of my well, second favorite graphs. You just saw my favorite graph. And they're all depressing. Annual economic growth in the early stages of economic recovery. Here's a comparison of every economic recovery we've had after a recession since 1948, as long as this data is around. All right. The economic growth since the end of the recession has only been 2.2%. Slower than any other time on annual growth. So I've got a punchline here. You're going to see a lot of talk about economic policy now, a lot of talk about what's wrong with the labor market, right? We need labor market policies that will train people, right? That will get them back to work. What's the problem with the labor market? It's not that people aren't trained, it's not that the government needs to spend more money on training people. In fact, there's a, there's a good story, I'll tell you just one second. It's, we just don't have enough economic growth. That's what you need is better economic growth. You can worry about whether there's job matching going on or not, whether people need to help in finding new work, but right now there just isn't work. Uh, in my last job, I can tell you at, at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the entire budget of the agency I headed was about a half a billion dollars, about five or six hundred million dollars a year, and we collected a lot of economic data, by the way. That's our entire budget a year. The department spent, just for green jobs, spent half a billion dollars training people for green jobs when I was there, and placed 9,000 people. Okay. There, there's an old joke. I, I love reviving this. There's an old joke about an atheist at his funeral, all dressed up and no place to go. Okay. You can train people all you want, but if there aren't jobs there, you're wasting money. Okay. It may be that you want to do something with training. You may want to have some labor market policy later when it's clear that there's a labor market problem. Right now, there's not a labor market problem. There's an economic problem. The economy's not growing. How much time to recovery? Now, this is the one where uh, put the sharp objects away. <laughs> this is the one that's maybe the most depressing to me. I did a little calculation. Um, if, if, if we recovered in one year, what kind of job growth would you need per month to have a one-year recovery? 975,000 jobs a month. All right, are we going to get that? Fastest one-year growth we've ever had is a little over 400,000. No, we're not going to get that. If we're going to, if we're going to recover in two years, you need 565,000 jobs a month. Have we ever had that in two years? Fastest two-year growth is 380,000 or so. Where do these two lines ultimately hit? Somewhere around six years, you're finally getting to where, gee, if we're going to recover in six years, we need 265,000 jobs a month. By the way, when's the last time we had 265,000 jobs a month consistently? 1990s, actually, is what that's worth. And we're talking like six years out before, we, before we've had a, a, any string of job growth at that slot. Right. So my, my basic punchline here is don't expect anything to happen quickly. We break records all the time. We might get great job growth, but historically we just don't get this kind of job growth. And second is unless we get job growth at least a quarter of a million jobs a month. I don't mean, I don't mean one month or two months. I mean month after month after month after month for years, unless we get a quarter million jobs growth, we're not making really good progress into recovery. So you gotta set your standards higher, right? You can get excited about 160,000 jobs. I look at that and I go, well, that's only about 30,000 above what we need. That's not much progress, right? I won't get excited until we get well, I'm not excited over a quarter of a million jobs until that keeps going month after month after month after month. It's what you need to really make the recovery. Now, of course, we may never recover, right? 
and that's going to be a problem, especially when we start to have baby boomers start to retire. Right? Uh, the economic forecasting I've, I've done, one of the things I learned, one of the things you worry about is that, uh, the call, something called the dependency ratio. How many people working do you have versus the population? That dependency ratio is already going to go down as baby boomers retire. In fact, that, that that's really lowers economic, it uh, really lowers economic forecasting. In fact, when, when I was doing the administration forecasting, we were looking at Gee, wh when is that going to kick in? And when do we start to need to start to really lower our economic growth forecast as baby boomers retire? Because it's going to have a big impact. Um, so anyway, uh, it, it makes a difference whether we get a full recovery or not. Uh, we're going to need we're going to need significant productivity growth no matter what. Recession or no recession, because you need this bump in productivity to manage the baby boomers retiring. And it, you don't need, surprisingly, don't need that much of a bump in productivity. But you need to have a bump in productivity. So this is, this, to me, this means markets have to work well. I'm a big believer in, in uh, government doing less. Uh, I have over 20 years as a, as a government economist. By far, most of my time is spent trying to kill off bad ideas, not trying to do more things. Uh, and and I, I think you need to resist bad ideas that interfere with things like economic growth and productivity going forward. Is that right? Thank you. Uh, oh, I'll take questions right after. I'm sorry. Okay. My questions uh, are primarily technical about the charts. I just sure. want to understand them a little better. Okay. I'll reserve my policy questions for later. <laughs> I guess you're gonna have a round table. Uh, early on in your first slide, uh, you indicated that the credit markets locked up after the housing drop. Right. Why did the credit markets lock up? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. And um, I'm not a financial economist. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that there was real worry, I was, because I was at the White House in the 2007, and, and I saw the real early, you know, Chairman Bernanke meeting with Secretary Paulson. They were really worried about this stuff. I didn't understand why, okay. <laughs> to be honest. I was, in fact, sitting there with a forecast kind of going, well, look, we shouldn't lower the forecast. Nobody else is. It's not clear to me that we're going to get a lock up in credit markets. But they locked up. Um, I think the, the most obvious thing, in fact, the thing I did, in fact, work on, though, was the subprime mortgages. Subprime mortgages were all over okay. the place. We had no economic data on, the, on it. In fact, our first cut, how many subprimes there are, we gave an estimate. Three months later, we like doubled it. Three months later, we increased it by 10 times. We had no idea how many were out there. We didn't collect the economic data. Okay. And those subprimes were all over the place, and it just really hurt confidence okay. in, the whole, in the value of things. That's as sophisticated as I get with that story. Okay. Uh, a second quick question on the effective federal funds rate. Yes. Um, I don't know if you can get to that slide quickly. Um, at 100% on the index, you'd index this, right. normalized it. What was the Fed funds rate at 100% if you go back to the beginning? I know you talked about the Fed funds rate uh, now right. being perhaps even negative when you consider some other things. But at 100% up at the top, what was the, just roughly, what was the Fed funds rate then? Gosh. I don't know. Two, uh, three percent? It was already pretty low. It was starting from a very low level um, after 2001. In fact, the Fed didn't really get much of a chance to, to reload their gun. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe somebody else knows offhand. I, I suffer from not being a financial economist, so yeah. I can fake being anything but a financial <laughs> economist. Uh, and again, I'll stop after this. Uh, on your average hourly earnings. Yes. I don't know if you can get to that slide quickly. Uh, Did I miss it? No. Here we go. There we go. What happened in 1980? Uh, the, the average hourly earnings is going up, up, up. Uh, and then in 1980, 81, 82, all of a sudden you see a significant drop. And uh, my. Uh, my memory isn't that good to know what the history was there. The, the double dip recession. We had the 1980 recession. Okay. 
and we didn't really get to a full recovery and the 81 recession hit. So I think that's all one recession, but we, we had the double dip recession. But you also said that's not correct. Right. You still have the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, a, that's a really good, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That is a, that's right. That's a time where we had the double, double digit inflation. Gotcha. And this is normalized? Uh, no, this is just, um, uh, this is just percent change. So it's in nominal terms. Okay. I, the re I didn't want to make it real because all the movements in real right now is from energy prices and it just confuses things. Thank you very kindly. I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hall. Uh, you, you mentioned this is the biggest disengagement ever from the workforce, but the only subgroup you mentioned um, was teenagers. Right. Are there data that identify other large components of the disengagement? Um, sure. Uh, you can break the data out more finely by age. Uh, you can break it out by ethnic background. You can break it out by education. Um, so yeah, the, you can break it out by, by a lot of ways. I'll tell you that the basic punchline, actually it's true of any recession. Um, the people who already had high unemployment rates, their unemployment rates go up by a lot. So, so African Americans, Hispanics have a bigger have a bigger increase in unemployment. They also have a bigger drop in labor force participation. People with lower education are harder hit. Their unemployment rates start higher; they go up by more. Labor force participation starts low; it goes down by more. Um, so, in in a sense, recessions pick on people who are already uh, at the at the bottom end of things. The housing crash that had started happening uh, around 2007, 2008. Right. There's an awful lot of talk about that the the subprime and the, and the government policies are what created that whole crash. How much can be laid at the feet of government policy a, as far as where we are right now, and um, right. what can we do to turn that around? Yeah, you know, I don't know. You know, I think I think there were a, a, a few things that were problems. Um, I can tell you, at, at my time at the CEA, um, I worked on. We actually produced a, a paper of systemic risk with the housing market, and we we looked at Fannie and Freddie in particular, and talked about what a risk that was, because because and I, I tell you what those places have have have, have done. What's happened to those? Originally, originally those places were there to sort of promote home ownership by low-income people. And that was their task. And it wound up being something that was helping everybody. In fact, it, it helps more middle-income. It didn't help low-income uh, low people at all because they can't, still can't afford houses. It's helped everybody else. And what those places did, they, they now grew to where they just held all the mortgages. And they got way, way bigger than anybody ever intended and they artificially lowered interest rates, mortgage interest rates, way below what they'd have been before. All right, that's clearly one of those impacts. And I can tell you uh, what we wrote was this is a risk. Because if things turn really bad in the housing market, you've got all your eggs in one basket here with that, that organization. We were also told, have fun with that, but it's a complete non-starter. Nobody can touch Fannie and Freddie because they've got really good Hill connections, they've got real support in the Hill. It's an absolute nothing. Um, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in this stuff. Uh, you'll see a lot of, lot, of, lot of talk about it. Some people know a lot more about that than, than I do. Uh, you know, there probably were issues with, well, I can tell you the basic problem with, with the subprimes. I don't know that I'm gonna set a finger on a policy issue, but it's a classical principal agent problem, right? What's the agency problem? It's, it's the people doing something don't have the right incentives. If you're a mortgage broker and you're giving out mortgages to people, and then you, as soon as you give out a mortgage, you aren't going to hold on to it. You're going to sell it into another market. Do you have incentive to do a good job and to not give loans to people who are high risk? Is that your incentive? It's not. Your incentive is, eh. Do something quick and sell it because you aren't going to have to bear the risk. That clearly was going on in, market, in mortgage markets. And that's clearly what, what made this big growth in subprimes, was this agency problem. Um, and that's, that's part of this whole problem, to be honest with Fannie and Freddie, because Fannie and Freddie takes every mortgage, 
They take it, they rebundle it, stick it in with other things. And it now becomes this financial instrument, a piece of which is a mortgage. And it, it creates a problem now, now that you have this whole financial instrument that, whose value is uncertain once we had this meltdown. Um, so anyway, that's... Which the uh, I forget what the, name, what the name of the program was, but housing redevelopment or something like this, where uh, the banks were required, forced uh, under law, to make subprime loans. And uh, then when the bank said, I, I can't do this, the, the, the Fannie and Freddie opened the floodgates and did exactly what you said was going on. But I think it goes back to policy issues, all the way back to the to the Carter administration. That's what laid the, uh, the foundation for the housing bubble. Well, there were certainly concerns about there being a housing bubble, I, I can tell you, for, for a long time. Yeah. As we look at long-term economic engines, right, that, uh, the growth of capital markets can be laid at the size of industry, the size of jobs. Right? So you just made a comment that concerns me. You were talking about... Only one? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. You were talking about the fact that the Affordable Housing Act helped the middle class. I would argue, I'm not an economist, that in fact it is the cause of the economic problems of the middle class today because it built a long-term economic engine that we cannot easily undo. Right? So I think it's dangerous to make a statement like that. That policy is decimating the middle class. I, let me just say, when I say it helped the middle class, I mean they took advantage of it. Okay? <laughs> I, and, and, and those, those loans, the, the, the low interest rates helped. And the, and the tax break, the mortgage tax breaks. You know, I, I can tell you um, a couple years before this happened, the European, there, there's, a, there's an international think tank called Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The U.S. is part of that, but it's, it's more than anything else, it's, it's dominated by the Europeans. They wrote a piece on the real distortion in the U.S. housing market, that the low cost of capital, housing capital, compared to other capitals being a real issue with the United States. And it would be Fannie and Freddie, would be the mortgage deduction. Uh, the big problem, of course, is how do you end that? We're all counting on it, <laughs> right? How do you stop doing something like that? It, it, it's difficult. Uh, just a, a real basic question for you, but how, how do they, the economics, um, how do you factor in or out the impact of federal and state spending, government spending, in the GDP numbers? Um, what they do with the GDP is, is they net out transfers. Right, so we, when you tax A and, and there's some sort of program that, that passes the income to person B, that's netted out, that's not part of GDP. It really is government spending though, it's, it's what, it's, it's the uh, government spending on goods and services. Um, and, and so that is counted in GDP and it is part of spending. And there's some indirect stuff that's not really counted because uh, the government will hire consultants who then um, who then spend the money, and that's kind of hard to separate out of GDP. But they're in there. Right now, I'd say uh, GDP, uh, government is maybe 19-ish percent of GDP right now is, is, is the public sector. Hi. I want to know why we count unemployment the way we do. Do we define unemployment as someone who wants to be employed? The problem, the, I'll tell you the problem with that is, and they, they, in fact, do this in the surveys. They go to people and they say, okay, we know you don't have work. Would you like a job? People say yes. When the unemployment rate's down to 4.5%, a ton of people say yes, I'd like to have a job. I just don't think I can get one. So the point being is you, when you do that, you capture a lot of people who aren't really, really going to work. They say they want a job. They say they want to work. But they aren't. But they, they, they don't work. Even in the best of times, they don't have, they don't have work. So you have a problem there with objectivity, because a, a lot more people say they'd like a job uh, uh, than they do. They could, in fact, change the unemployment rate to include that stuff. 
but there's, there's still lots of issues with it. I think what they've done is I think they've made a definition that makes it easy to measure. They can measure it well. It's just not so useful. But we keep talking about 8.3 versus 15. I guess right. I'm trying to figure out why is it the lower number that's always reported as opposed to the higher number? Because it sounds better? Right. Makes us feel good? Well, there, there, I can tell you, there are problems with U6. Okay. Uh, U6 uh, adds in people who say they want work, and it could be that they've never, you know, they've never really had work. It also adds in who are people who are part-time who want to be full-time. So you, if you work 38 hours, that count, they count you as unemployed in U6. Okay, that's, that's not right. So the middle one is particularly good. Right. Thank you. They haven't invented a good one. I, that's, I, I like the employment to population ratio because it sort of, it, it tells you something that cuts through all this. Okay, this could get a little complicated, but I'll try not to. But. Have, have you That's my anyone? job to complicate things. Okay. <laughs> um, has anyone ever looked at such a thing as GDP in terms of raw dollars divided by what I would call the eligible population to see what GDP per person is and how that trends over time? And is there a period in time that maybe we reached a peak and we've fallen off that now? What's sustainable in that? And what role does government spending play in that? whole process. There's only about four questions there, so okay. hurry up. <laughs> um, the, the measure you're talking about is GDP per capita. It's a common measure, and it's, it's, it's the most common way of, of looking at how wealthy a country is. You can compare GDP per capita uh, for different countries, and you can, you can right away see who's wealthy and who's not. Um, and, and that is a common measure, and I can, I can tell you, for example, Yeah, it's, it's per population. So this idea is, is, is how many people are you supporting with the income generated from GDP? So, so it does give you something that that's, tells you about how wealthy you are over time. Um, well, see, one of the things, that's also some, some degree, that's a measure of productivity, right? It's, it's a raw measure. Uh, they're, they're more, more sophisticated ones, but that's a reasonable measure of productivity. And you, you, we always have productivity growth, so we always have a growth in per capita GDP. And you always want to have growth in per capita GDP if you can. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it has been. I, I don't see any reason why not. Um, think, about, think about your life 20 years ago and your life now. You know? But, well, but you know, in terms of the stuff we've got, I mean, it's, 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 really, it's really changed, maybe for the better, maybe not. But th that's a big issue of debate, is sustainability. Okay. Right. Um, I, I, have a, I have a real simple view of government spending, all right? Because, um, um, especially borrowing, you know, you, you think of it like a household. If the government is taxing you and they're blowing it, it's like your house. It's like you're borrowing money in your credit card and you're buying stuff. Well, is that a problem? Well, at some point it will be. If you're using your credit card and you're buying stuff for your business, which raises productivity, that's a good investment. All right, if government's spending money on stuff that makes the economy work better and makes the economy more productive, then it's a, it's a reasonable investment. If they're just spending it on stuff that doesn't have any real value in terms of economic growth, it's not worth much, right? So I, I just think of it in terms of, of, of a household. So, um, you know, one of the things that's a big point of debate is, is to the degree that government spending increases economic growth, there's even concern that government spending crowds out private sector spending and does the opposite. It's a big debate, lots of work on it. Um, you know, and then of course the big role of government winds up being just transferring money around. And you have to think about whether, whether that's reasonable spending or not. And that, that probably doesn't help economic growth, but it might be something you want to do. But anyway, I, I just I think of it in terms of a household. You know, if, you go, if you're going to spend money out of your house, especially if you're borrowing money like we are, what are you buying with it? 
Is it, is it something worth having? Is it something that's going to make you more productive in the future, or are you just buying stuff? Yeah. We'll go to our last question here. And if you guys have other ones, remember the cards on the table. Feel free to write those down, and we'll definitely get back to Keith on lunch. So this gentleman here. I'm going to put you on a spot with your crystal ball. If there were one or two things that you could point to that would make either policy changes or issues that could make a real positive change to turn in this economy around, what do you think those one or two things would be? Yeah, that, that, that's a tough one because there's no, if you look at this data, you look at the basic data, we should be having much stronger economic growth. There's no real good reason why we aren't recovering faster. Um, uh, to me right now, it's just simple fear. It's, it's, simple, it's simple real concern over real risks going forward. Um, you know, what's gonna happen with the election? What's gonna happen in terms of, of government? You know, how much, you know, are we gonna get a jump in regulation or not? Are we gonna get a jump in taxes or not? I think there's a great deal of uncertainty. I think there's a lot of holdback until a lot of that's resolved. Um, I, I, in fact, I even think our economic growth, by the way, is a little bit overestimated because a good portion of that growth is from exports. In fact, we've had the mo more export support this recovery than we ever have in the past, meaning it's not U.S. consumers that are pulling us along and, and you get into the cycle of consumer spending, job creation, it's foreign consumers. Well, what's going to happen to Europe? What's going to happen in some of those other countries? If, if something bad happens there, we're going to lose that export support. That's a, that's, it's a, a, exports have been about 30% of the economic growth since this recovery started. 30% has been foreign consumers. That makes it riskier. I think risk is the big thing. And, and I, I don't know that I have a, there are no, no policy tools that, you know, there's no more, the, the Fed could throw the gun. But, but to me, you just, you gotta, the private sector's got to get confident. And it's got to spend some money. And, and I think households need to work through their, balance, their budget issues, their, their balance sheets. People need to finish it sort of adjusting what they're going to spend on. Uh, you know, I, I, like I, I, that, that was, I think the government has much more potential to, to interfere than it does to help. That, that, that's, just, that's my view of it. And, and so I'm, I think the government needs to be think through what they're going to do. And like I say, I think that's part of it, is fear of what, what the government's going to do is holding things back. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hall. And we'll continue on to our next speaker, but again, if at any point you need to refill your coffee or head to the restroom, please feel free. And we'll have um, a 10 minute break after this next session as well. And uh, before I introduce our next speaker, I wanted to make